Natural disaster, famine, disease, and war. There is no question that mankind's history has been paved with destruction and pain. But this is not the story of a pessimist. It is the story of an eternal optimist. Born in Germany at the end of the Thirty Years' War, a war fought primarily in Germany that left millions dead. This is the story of Leibniz. The Enlightenment is often associated with the promotion of knowledge and an end to religious intolerance and superstition. Many of the French and English Enlightenment figures are the founding fathers of Anglo-American philosophy and thought, with their focus on materialism, empiricism, and practical common sense. I should point out that they stand in direct opposition to the philosophy of Leibniz and his tradition. Isaac Newton, John Locke, Pierre Bayle are examples of Enlightenment figures, and another good example is Voltaire. But even though Voltaire is an Enlightenment figure, we will see how Voltaire's attack on Leibniz is very similar to the Church's attack on a heretic. Dr. Martin Evans of Stanford University has two excellent lectures to his students on Voltaire's mockery of Leibniz in the Candide as part of a course called Literature of Crisis, an amazing course available completely online. I will provide the link below to this podcast. In this lecture, after Professor Evans says that the utterly terrible Lisbon earthquakes and tsunamis that killed so many thousands had completely rocked Voltaire's worldview at a time when he was actually flirting with the philosophy of Leibniz. According to Dr. Evans, this was thanks in part to Voltaire's Leibnizian mistress. But the events of the earthquake and tsunamis shattered Voltaire's ability to support an optimistic philosophy. In the mass destruction caused by the quake and by three huge tidal waves, tsunamis, uh, which were over 50 feet high, you can imagine. 50 feet high, a wall of water that high engulfed the city. And more than 60,000 people were killed in that short period of time. The entire city was reduced to rubble. Professor Evans then goes on to quote the Christian theologian, St. Augustine, who compares the evil we see in the world, disease, earthquakes, etc., to the dark regions of a painting, which on their own may be ugly, but taken as a whole make the picture more magnificent, harmonious, and beautiful. That represents the totalist answer to the theodicy. Then, two more theodicies are offered. The Manichaeans offered a dualistic mixture of good and evil, such as the mixture of pleasure and pain. Thirdly, the biblical answer, based on Genesis, from the Christian dogma, claims that evil exists because the serpent tempted mankind away from God's perfect plan tempted away with the knowledge, the knowledge of, good and evil. of good and evil. So according to Christianity in this period, the evil god of the Manichees, the malign and evil deity of the Manichees, was in reality no more than a fallen angel, Satan, Lucifer, who had deceived himself into believing that he was the equal of God, and who, after he failed to supplant God during the war in heaven, 
devoted himself for all eternity to despoiling God's creation. Now, the first of these three theories, the totalist theory, was particularly prominent in the 18th century and particularly popular thanks to the labors of a great German philosopher called Leibniz. We all should be grateful to Leibniz because he invented calculus. He's the inventor of calculus. But he was a great, great philosopher as well as a mathematician. And he wrote a book and published it in 1710 called the Theodicy. Remember that word from uh, discussion of Boethius. Theodicy from Theos God, D.K. Justice. It's a demonstration or an attempt at a demonstration of the justice of God. And one of Leibniz's most famous disciples was the great 18th century English poet I mentioned before, Alexander Pope. In the three theodicies that Professor Evans mentions, Leibniz's totalism, the Manichaean dualism, and the Christian doctrine of original sin, Voltaire, according to Dr. Evans, possibly accepted Leibniz's totalist view as valid. However, according to Voltaire's own letters quoted in this lecture, Voltaire sought to convert the philosophers he called heretics away from being Leibnizians because they committed the sin of consuming the knowledge of good and evil, tempted by that free thinker Leibniz, drawing parallels here to Lucifer. For Candide reads rather like a brief sequel to the first three chapters of Genesis. A sequel in which we find out what happened to Adam and Eve after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Chapter 1 thus begins with a light-hearted comic parody of the fall itself, with Candide playing the role of Adam, who is seduced by his female companion, Cunegonde playing the role of Eve, who acquires forbidden knowledge, Pangloss the role of the serpent, who passes on that forbidden knowledge to Eve, and finally the Baron acting as the Archangel, who expels the innocent young man and woman from their blissful paradise. What Voltaire is attacking, it seems to me, is not just the philosophy of optimism, but all useless metaphysical speculations about subjects which are ultimately unknowable. In an earlier work, he put it like this. Let us put at the end of almost all these chapters of metaphysics, the two letters that Roman judges used when they couldn't understand a case. N L, known liquid. It's not clear. Unless I'm very much mistaken then, the moral of Candide is simply that we should just get on with our gardening and not worry ourselves with useless, sterile, metaphysical speculations. In the final analysis then, the message of Candide, I think, is not so very different from that of a famous line in Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Ours not to reason why, ours but to do and die, unquote. It is a message that I hope you will resist for the rest of your lives. The Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason, which provides the backbone of modern Anglo-American thought, is associated with freedom from religious dogma and the promotion of free thought. But here, in Dr. Evans' interpretation, we have in a major Enlightenment figure, Voltaire, more or less telling us to be stupid slaves to the plan. As all this may suggest, I think, 
You need to think long and hard before characterizing Condé as an unqualified attack on the optimistic view of things. In addition to what I just said about Pangloss, for example, we need to take into account the fact that the deity, the deity that's described in Candide, is in fact, in all essentials, the deity of the optimistic hero. Sa Ortes, his highness, as Voltaire calls him. And his highness, we learn, is completely unconcerned with the plight of his creatures. We don't need to know the plan. We must simply execute our small part, according to Voltaire. In fact, it is forbidden to know the plan. Philosophy would undergo many attacks in the centuries to follow from this view. The attack and attempted eradication in philosophy of metaphysics. We will see in later videos how logical positivism, for example, continued Voltaire's cause of eradicating purely free conceptual generalizations in philosophy. That is, to convert heretics. But Leibniz's optimism is really one of knowledge about the world becoming able to gradually know more and more and becoming happy through this. As the great scholar Professor Alison Coder of UC Davis said in her excellent book, Leibniz in the Kabbalah, on page 125, Leibniz's optimism is not captured in Voltaire's simple mantra that this is the best of all possible worlds. According to Professor Coder, Leibniz really believes, quote, that this world is the best because it has the capacity to become better and better, unquote. Professor Coder says that in his later years, Leibniz held the Gnostic view that all individual things eventually reach perfection through repeated transformations, and that Leibniz reached this view after the influence of his friend, the Kabbalist Mercurius von Helmont. Quoting Leibniz on page 128 through 129, Professor Kodert highlights a few especially Kabbalistic sentences. Quote, God contains all in one, and everything tends toward this one. This is the highest good of all things. The immortal part of man must dominate astral fate. Wisdom is greater than fate. Those who think about the immortal part of themselves recognize the angels as brothers. Those who engage in contemplating these things and dwell on eternal matters, removing the soul from sensible things, will be removed from corporeal contagion and dominate the stars. They will see the clouds of the stars of heaven beneath their feet." Unquote. Leibniz goes on to add that, quote, men become happy by obtaining divinity, unquote, and refers to God as a maximum of infinity. In our story so far, we have the surprising revelation that Voltaire was actually against free conceptualizations of the mind. But this interpretation of Voltaire would have not surprised the 20th century mathematical logician Kurt Gödel, the subject of parts 22 through 28 of this 42-part video series. Gödel's friend Karl Manger wrote in his memoirs that Goethe believed in a century-old conspiracy not only to suppress Leibniz's writings, but to generally keep mankind from exploiting the power of free conceptual thinking. 
quoting pages 222 through 223 of Reminiscences of the Vienna Circle, Menger asked Gödel, Who had an interest in destroying Leibniz's writings? Naturally, those people who do not want man to become more intelligent, he replied. Since it was unclear to me whom he suspected, I asked, after groping for a response, don't you think that they would sooner have destroyed Voltaire's writings? Gödel's astonishing answer was, whoever became more intelligent by reading the writings of Voltaire. During Voltaire's lifetime, Europe was still engulfed in a nasty intellectual civil war between Newton's system and Leibniz's. Both systems represented two possible foundations for the new era that was just beginning, perhaps best generalized as the scientific age that we are still living in today, where science has more respect than even philosophy, and where mysticism has virtually no respect at all. But it never really has had any respect to the ruling system. For example, just 46 years before Leibniz's birth, the Roman Catholic Church burned Giordano Bruno alive for his views. Bruno was both a mystic and a legitimate scientist, far ahead of his time. I have personally come across Bruno's name several times in Gödel's personal unpublished notebooks. But Voltaire was a Newtonian, as was much of the Enlightenment in England, in America, and even on the continent where Leibniz support was centered. Even in Germany, Newton had great popularity. For example, the great German mathematician Carl Gauss sided with Newton in science. In this illustration, Newton's almost godlike light shines down on Voltaire. As the modern age of science grew from a lowly place in the Dark Ages to its current position of dominance, the Church lost much of its political power. The Church's position was based on the authority of its doctrines, allegedly based on revelation, an authority to be followed even in the face of reason. Today, historians often exalt the Enlightenment for dethroning the Church and allowing science to freely advance. But it is often overlooked that there was another contender for the modern scientific age, and this one is based on Leibniz and his tradition, a worldview arguably more free because it encompasses not only reason, but metaphysics and, on its fringes, mysticism. But in the end, Voltaire's side won and would define the zeitgeist of the centuries to follow. Leibniz's tradition, a heresy of the age of the church, and a heresy in the modern age of science. Fittingly, the default philosophical schema in the age of science puts science above philosophy instead of the other way around as you might find in Leibniz's tradition. To the credit of Newtonian science, it might be wrong, but it can get us to the moon. But as Kurt Gödel once wrote in a letter as reported in Reflections on Kurt Gödel on page 123 by Hao Wang, quote, you are completely right that mankind is not improved through the moon flight. This has to do with the old conflict between natural and spiritual sciences. There would be no danger of atomic war if advances in history, the science of right, and of state, philosophy, psychology, literature, art, etc., were as great as in physics. But instead of such progress, one is struck by significant regresses in many of the spiritual sciences.
We have touched upon the contrast between Leibniz and Newton and the war between their two worldviews. In future videos, we will further explore how even though Leibniz and Newton are each alchemists and highly motivated by esoteric teachings, they represent two very different kinds of esotericists. Newton kept his obsessions with secret knowledge hidden and saw himself more as a prophet. To oversimplify a bit for clarity, Newton represents those who keep their esoteric knowledge secret. They have no interest in bettering mankind by spreading what they know. Leibniz represents those who publicly promote human knowledge for the betterment of mankind. With Newton, time is absolute. With Leibniz, time is relative and really doesn't exist in a pure sense. Newton represents those who believe in the limitations of human speculation and who are skeptical of metaphysics. Instead, Newton relies on divine revelation through prophecy. Leibniz represents those who promote speculation, metaphysics, and free conceptualizations. With Newton, the forbidden apple falls on his head by chance. As for Leibniz, he eats the forbidden apple without apologies and encourages us to do so as well. These differences are highlighted in Professor Allison Codert's paper, Newton and the Rosicrucian Enlightenment, when she writes, quote, For Newton, the greatest scientist of his age was decidedly hostile to Gnostics of any sort, and this included Rosicrucians. Newton's criticism of Gnosticism lies at the heart of his conflict with Leibniz. Codert later goes on saying that, quote, Newton was especially antagonized by the Jewish Kabbalah, which he considered a major source for Gnosticism that had distorted the clear, straightforward teachings of early Christianity. Later she goes on, quote, Newton believed that the primitive Christianity had been contaminated by three sources, the Kabbalah, Platonism, and Gnosticism. He looked for the source of all three heresies in Egypt, and variously suggested that Kabbalists learn their odious doctrines from Plato, or vice versa. He objected to Platonists, Kabbalists, and Gnostics on similar grounds. All three were responsible for introducing metaphysics into theology, thereby distorting the simple teachings of primitive Christianity. Newton insists that the, quote, scriptures were given to teach men not metaphysics, but morals, unquote. Leibniz is more in alignment with Giordano Bruno. Professor Coder, in the previously mentioned paper, writes that to Bruno, those who willingly accept limits to intellectual inquiry are asses, in his opinion. Because, now quoting Bruno, they remain unable to stretch out their hands, like Adam, to pluck the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. And in consequence, they remain without the fruits of the tree of life." Unquote. Leibniz belongs to the esoteric tradition, which, unlike Newton, believes in emanation, innate ideas, and optimism. Leibniz was influenced by the Kabbalah, which Newton so despised. There is an important point of clarity needed here. Again, quoting Professor Codert's paper, quote, Although Plotinus accused Gnostics of despising the sensible world, this was not true of all Gnostics. In recent years, especially as a result of the Gnostic text found at Nag Hammadi, 
certain Gnostics have been shown to have had a more optimistic worldview. And this is the view that survived in the Hermetic texts, translated by Ficino, in alchemy, in the Kabbalah, and in Neoplatonism. In these sources, one can find a monadic gnosis, in which there was no chasm between man and God, or need for a mediator between the two. Thus, I would agree wholeheartedly with Trevor Roper's suggestion that the origins of the Enlightenment are to be found in heresy. If one thinks about the Enlightenment and the origins of the scientific age with a much wider historical view than one focused on Newton, Voltaire, Locke, Thomas Jefferson at all, one sees that it also has much to attribute to the other tradition which encourages man to become divine through eating the forbidden fruit. In fact, Professor Codert's paper is more or less in defense of Francis Yates' thesis that the larger Enlightenment movement was more the result of hermeticists, magicians, and mystics than skeptics and materialists. Yates called this the Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Professor Codert agrees with this thesis so long as hermeticism is downplayed a bit and in place of it is Gnosticism. This is despite the fact that Newton opposed Gnosticism, and I think this exposes a historical bias that few may be aware of. For Voltaire's movement was successful in making Newton the Messiah of the Enlightenment. And to this day we often ignore the fact that the move to the Age of Reason was already well underway before Newton. As the great scholar Ansk Kassiro wrote in his article Newton and Leibniz, quote, Most of the empirical evidence Newton needed for constructing his optical theories or his theory of gravitation was contained in the work of former scientists or contemporaries in the work of Galileo and Kepler, of Snelius and Fermat, of Christian Huygens, and of Halley or Hooke. Newton's real merit lay in uniting and concentrating the different and dispersed achievements of these men. The most important and the most characteristic feature of his work was not so much the discovery of new facts as the new interpretation of data already available." Unquote. This interpretation of Newton's is highly motivated by what Professor Coder describes as his desire to bring mankind back to a pre lapsian perfection through Newtonian science, a science free of metaphysics. Newton's ultimate quest was to uncover the Prisca Theologia, or the single true ancient esoteric religion, and it is similar but not exactly the same as the perennial philosophy of Leibniz in his tradition of Western mystics. Because theirs shows up every now and then, whereas Newton's is only found in the perfect form in the ancient. According to Helen Fryman's article called The Religious Beliefs of Sir Isaac Newton, quote, divine revelation, as Newton understood it, centered on two books, Daniel and Revelation, which revealed the almighty dominion of God over history as natural philosophy revealed his dominion over nature, unquote. Voltaire actually learned from Samuel Clark much of Newton's religious views, not just his scientific ones. And my thesis is that the anti-Gnostic, anti-metaphysical war waged by Newton and Voltaire would have been ideal historically if it had remained a minor critical counter-trend to the larger Gnostic trends of the Enlightenment. However, they were too effective at dominating and directing the zeitgeist, and may actually have done more harm than good. For there are many things of value in Leibniz's life work that were ignored until someone else rediscovered them, sometimes a century or more later. A good example was mathematical logic. And it might clarify matters to see 
two enlightenments at work, one being the greater movement away from religious authority and towards a scientific and scholarly progress, and is thanks, at least in part, to the modern emergence of Gnosticism and ancient secret knowledge that was forbidden during the Dark Ages. It began not with Newton's Principia, but with Renaissance magic, Hermeticism, the Kabbalah, Neoplatonism, Platonism, and above all else, Gnosticism. This is the Enlightenment supported by Professor Codert's paper and also by Yeats's book The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, both go into much more depth than I do here. The other, lesser Enlightenment as I call it, is of the empiricists and Newtonians, and in reality it was a smaller counter-movement to this greater one. According to my thesis, along with Newton and Voltaire, this lesser enlightenment consisted of figures like Locke, Bale, and Thomas Jefferson. And while they all were certainly intellectuals with many good ideas, this movement was certainly not without its religious and philosophical extremism in its hatred of metaphysics. And it is my thesis that the correct view is too subtle for extremism. To this day, metaphysics is alive and well, despite the heroic attempts for over 200 years to kill it off. In this image, I offer my view of the intellectual progress of Western history, albeit in an extremely oversimplified way. To make it clear, let's face it, the real picture probably looks like this. Many Protestant currents of thought at the time that were in alignment with what I would call the Lesser Enlightenment favored nominalist anti-realism, which is the extreme opposite from platonic realism. Socinianism is a good example, and Locke and possibly others were favorable of it. Unlike Platonism, with its focus on internal experience and innate ideas, Nominalism focuses on external reality and thus favors empiricism and rejects universals. On the one hand, they oppose the Catholic Church's weakened Aristotelian realism, but a more obvious enemy was the pure realism of Platonism. Nominalism would become the default bias of the modern age especially in English-speaking nations. And it is my thesis in this video series that the Platonists like Leibniz, Cantor, Gödel, and others made their great discoveries, which advanced human knowledge as a direct result of being Platonists in this tradition. Gödel even stresses this at times. And that Gnosticism and Platonism have played a very large part in moving mankind forward. Nominalism and skepticism are important too, I would argue, as healthy counter-movements to curb the excesses of unbridled idealism and to keep it honest. But while Leibniz was a Platonist, he was not an unbridled one. He took the best from all philosophies and even had his roots in Aristotelianism. His Platonism was well tested. Today the religious aspects of nominalism have gone away. But the history books are already written. And it is only when we become aware of the intellectual legacies we have both inherited and forgotten that we can judge them on their merits, instead of taking them as a sort of default. The mistake made by Voltaire and his small extremist movement was to conspire to base the modern world on a purely negative attitude. And this sheds some light on Gödel's conspiracy theories regarding a dark force keeping mankind from advancing and why he saw humanity as being off track since the times of Leibniz. Historians often give the what I call lesser enlightenment full credit for doing away with church political rule and the emergence of religious tolerance and free speech and thought. 
But on closer examination, we find that they were attacking the free speculations of metaphysics in the idea that man can obtain divine knowledge through philosophy, at least as much as they attacked anything else. If the modern emergence of Gnosticism is what brought mankind out of the Dark Ages, then the counter-movement of Newton and Voltaire is a step against this progress. Which is a good thing, as I have stated, as long as it is only a critical kind of skepticism, but a disastrous thing if blown out of proportion. And while the Enlightenment of Newton and Voltaire are often associated with religious tolerance, the truth is more complex, and in some ways the complete opposite. Voltaire and Newton and others were motivated by a religious intolerance to destroy Leibniz and to exalt Newton as a Christ-like figure of the modern world, a view that Newton held and one that Voltaire spent much of his energy promoting. To Newton, Leibniz was a heathen to be destroyed. To quote Dr. Kurt von S. Kainel's book, The Mind of Leibniz, William Whiston incredulously reported that Sir Isaac Newton also once pleasantly told Dr. Clark that he had broke Leibniz's heart with his reply to him. Unquote. And this was during the Great Calculus Wars that we will cover in a later video. If Newton was the god of the Enlightenment, he certainly was a wrathful god. I would like to now quote Hegel in his lectures on the history of philosophy when writing about Leibniz. He begins, quote, As in other respects, Leibniz represents the extreme antithesis to Newton. So in respect of philosophy, he presents a striking contrast to Locke and his empiricism, and also to Spinoza. He upholds thought as against the perception of the English school, and in lieu of sensuous being, he maintains being for thought to be the essence of truth. Just as Burma at an earlier time upheld implicit being. While Spinoza asserted the universality, the openness of substance merely, and while with Locke we saw infinite determinations made the basis, Leibniz, by means of his fundamental principle of individuality, brings out the essentiality of the opposite aspect of Spinoza's philosophy. Existence for self, the monad. But the monad regarded as the absolute notion, though perhaps not quite yet as the I. The opposed principles, which were forced asunder, find their completion in each other, since Leibniz's principle of individuation completed Spinoza's system as far as outward aspects goes. Later on, Hegel then offers a brief summary of Leibniz's early biography, covered in other videos in the series. Hegel makes reference to Leibniz's involvement as a secretary of a Rosicrucian secret society. Hegel writes that shortly after Leibniz was awarded his doctorate in law, quote, he became antiquated in Nuremberg with a company of alchemists, with whose ongoings he became associated. Here he made extracts from alchemist writings and studied the mysteries of this occult science. His activity in the pursuit of learning extended also to historical, diplomatic, mathematical, and philosophical subjects." Unquote. Hegel adds a caveat about Leibniz's only popularly published book in his lifetime, The Theodicy, and offers some criticism. Quote, 
Leibniz's theodicy is not what we can altogether appreciate. It is a justification of God in regard to the evil in the world. Buell says, quote, His philosophy is not so much the product of free, independent, original speculation as the result of a well-tested and earlier and later systems, an eclecticism whose defects he tried to remedy in his own way. It is a desultory treatment of philosophy in letters, unquote. Continuing quoting Hegel, Leibniz followed the same general plan in his philosophy as the physicists adopt when they advance a hypothesis to explain existing data. He has it that general conceptions of the idea from which the particular may be derived. Here, on account of existing data, the general conception, for example, the determination of force or matter furnished by reflection, must have its determinations disposed in such a way that it fits with the data. Thus, the philosophy of Leibniz seems to be not so much a philosophic system as an hypothesis regarding the existence of the world, namely, how it is to be determined in accordance with the metaphysical determinations and the data and assumptions of the ordinary conception which are accepted as valid. Thoughts which are moreover propounded without the sequence pertaining to the notion and mainly in narrative style and which taken by themselves show no necessity in their connection. Leibniz's philosophy therefore appears to be a string of arbitrary assertions which follow one on another like a metaphysical romance it is only when we see what he wished to thereby avoid that we learn to appreciate its value. Leibniz's philosophy is an idealism of the intellectuality of the universe. Leibniz's philosophy makes fundamental the absolute multiplicity of individual substances, which, after the example of the ancients, he named monads, an expression already used by the Pythagoreans." Unquote. We will discuss monadology later, but Hegel goes on to describe what he calls the universal. It stands in contrast to the monads, in that monads, even though they have some element of unity in themselves, can make up a multiplicity. The universal, on the other hand, unifies. Hegel goes on, quote, the universal itself, absolute essence, which with Leibniz is something quite different from the monads, separates itself also into two sides, namely universal being and being as the unity of opposites. That universal is God, as the cause of the world, to the consciousness of whom the above principle of sufficient reason certainly forms the transition. The existence of God is only an inference from eternal truths, for these must, as the laws of nature, have a universal sufficient reason which determines itself as none other than God. Eternal truth is therefore the consciousness of the universal, an absolute in and for itself. And this universal and absolute is God, who, as one with himself, the monad of monads, is the absolute monad. Here we again have the wearisome proof of his existence. He is the fountain of eternal truths and notions, and without him, no potentiality would have actuality. He has the prerogative of existing immediately in his potentiality. God is here also the unity of potentiality and actuality, but in an uncomprehending manner. What is necessary, but not comprehended, is transferred to him. Thus God is at first comprehended chiefly as universal, but already in the aspect of the relation of opposites." Unquote. 
This is interesting that Hegel stresses the concept of the unification of opposites present in Leibnizian thinking. Such a concept comes directly from Nicholas of Cusa, who spoke about the unification of opposites as being God in great lengths. Concerning the unity of opposites as viewed by Leibniz, Hegel continues, quote, As regards the absolute relation of opposites, it occurs in the first place in the form of absolute opposites of thought, the good and the evil. God is the author of the world, says Leibniz. That refers directly to evil. It is around this relation that philosophy specially revolves, but to the unity of which it did not then attain. The evil in the world was not comprehended because no advance was made beyond the fixed opposition. The result of Leibniz's theodicy is an optimism supported on the lame and wearisome thought that God, since a world had to be brought into existence, chose out of infinitely many possible worlds the best possible, the most perfect. So as far as it could be perfect, considering the finite element which it was to contain. This may very well be said in a general way, but this perfection is no determined thought, but a loose popular expression, a sort of babble respecting an imaginary or fanciful potentiality. Voltaire bade marry of it. Nor is the nature of the finite therein defined, because the world, it is said, has to be the epitome of finite beings. Evil could not be separated from it, since evil is negation, finitude, unquote. So Hegel is unsatisfied with the degree to which Leibniz fails to determine the concept of both perfection and the infinite and the finite and evil in an exact way. But we will often look into how these very ideas can be made more precise throughout this video series. Please continue on to the next video where we will dig deeper into Leibniz's philosophy on life. And remember to visit GaryGeck.com.